Well, hello again and welcome to our devotions here at Christ Baptist Church as we're going through the book of Jonah. Uh, if you haven't joined us uh, before, we've gone through several books of the Bible, the book of Daniel, the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, along with practical devotions, and now we're in the book of Jonah. And we've gone through Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2 uh, in perhaps uh, just one of the most memorable stories of Scripture uh, right up there with Daniel in the lion's den, and David and Goliath, and Jonah and the fish. And uh, understanding that this story is about far more than just a man and a fish. Uh, as we said, this is the greatest, world's greatest fish story. Instead of saying, uh, I, I caught a, a man saying, I caught a fish this big, it's about a fish saying, I caught a man this big. But that's really not what the story is about, as we've learned here in Jonah chapters 1 and 2. And uh, now we're going to be in Jonah chapter 3 today. And so if we remember Jonah, uh, Jonah was a prophet of the north of Galilee and God called him to go to Nineveh, the most wicked enemies that they had. And Jonah's heart was so hard, he ran away from the presence of the Lord. We see that numerous times in chapter 1. He wanted to get as far away from God as possible because he didn't want God's will to be accomplished. Even though he was a prophet of God, he did not want God's message to get to these people because he knew that if they didn't get God's message, they would experience his judgment. And, uh, and so we see in Jonah chapter 1 that, that he was given a simple message to go cry against Nineveh because essentially his, their, their wickedness had come up against him and, and so God's patience was done with them. But Jonah did not want to give that message and we saw from chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 that the reason he didn't was because he knew that God might forgive them. And so he went away from, from God and God pursued Jonah but, but not because he was so concerned about the Ninevites. That was there for sure. We're going to see that not only was God concerned about the Ninevites, he's also concerned about Israel. We'll see that in chapter 4. But God was concerned about Jonah. And so he gave Jonah the message to go deliver to this to the Ninevites and he specifically wanted Jonah to give the message because Jonah needed to give the message because there was something in Jonah that Jonah needed to learn but Jonah was running away and the captain had to wake him up and uh, he got with the sailors and the sailors pointed him out and, and, and there's an interesting perspective here as well in chapter 1 that the men we're trying to figure out how to get out of the situation where everybody lived and they weren't angry at Jonah. They tried to row away, verse 13 of chapter 1, to return to the land, but the, the God wouldn't let them. The sea kept getting more stormy <coughs> as they were trying to get away. And so they, they didn't want to, to, to hurt Jonah in any way. And so even though Jonah told them in verse 12, he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Now, here's your observation. Jonah didn't say, I'll just go jump into the sea. He didn't do that. He said, you pick me up and throw me into the sea. See, that way it won't be my fault. I won't be killing myself to, uh, to get away from God. You'll be killing me. So you can pick me up and throw me out. Therefore, it's my hands are clean. It's not my fault. See, Jonah was looking any way he could to get away from God and have it not be Jonah's fault in every way. And so even though he tried that and he had to throw him overboard, God had a fish ready for Jonah to take Jonah and hold him there fast in the water. And, uh, and then brought him uh, eventually into land. But after Jonah spent time in prayer in the belly of the fish, and as we saw uh, in the last devotion, Jonah's prayer was very much still one of blaming God as he said, you know, verse 3, you cast me into the deep. You had these men cast me into the deep. It wasn't me. Your breakers, your billows passed over me. It's all about you, God, that you did this to me. That's why I'm here. Not realizing that he himself was the one who booked the boat ticket. He himself is the one who got on the boat with the sailors and he himself told the sailors to throw him overboard. He didn't confess any of that. And he was just confessing his own self-righteousness about saying, I remember the Lord in verse 7 of chapter 2. My prayer came to you in your holy temple. But those, those 
pagan people who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. He kept going. God's not answering back until at the very end when he said, salvation is from the Lord. And then God commanded the fish and it spit Jonah out on dry land. And that takes us now to chapter 3. And the one thing we see here is we don't see anything about how that fish spit Jonah out onto dry land. Notice it's the dry land there. It's not land, but dry land. And, and again, that, that's probably more supernatural than having a fish swallow Jonah. That's happened many times in human history, but I don't think it's ever happened that a fish spit out a man and he made it all the way to dry land. But nevertheless, that happened. And then we see now God telling Jonah, okay, let's get on with the mission. So chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So, there's a second time. God's saying, Jonah, we, we went through this, now we're going to get right, and we're going to go. Nineveh was quite a, quite a ways away from the sea, from the ocean, where he would have been spit out. And, uh, and, and so the text doesn't tell us how he got to Nineveh, how it happened, but he made his way there. And, uh, and, and verse 3 then says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So very simple verses just tell us in quick action without telling us what's happening in between and how it all happened. But we do see in verse 3 that now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. A, a great city, a city to God, a city that's mighty. And it, the idea is that it's a big city. History tells us it's about 600,000 people, which was very big at that time. So it's a very large city, and it says a three days walk. That meant to go through the whole city would take three days. If you want to cover every city, cover everything around the city, all about the city, anything into the city, it's going to be a three days walk. So you can't cover it in a day. That's a big city for those times. Then Jonah began to go through the city, one day's walk, that meant he's on his first day of going through. And he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was his sermon, that was his message. So he came here to give that message. Now I checked this, uh, 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 my Hebrew Bible and it's literally six words that are together seven if you include the little word and which is attached to a word and that's all it was you see jo Jonah did not speak the words of Nineveh Nineveh did not speak the words of Israel which is Hebrew so it was completely different languages but yet he spoke these languages he spoke these words because it, it had to be a very simple sermon and most of the words here are common, just like you have common words in between the languages in Africa. And, and so like Nineveh would be the same in both Assyrian language and in Hebrew, it would be Nineveh. And uh, you know, 40 days, the idea of day was a common word, like we have a common word computer that we would use all throughout. The word day was common in Assyrian and Hebrew language. So yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And, and the idea of will be overthrown, that's one word that's going to be a common loan word as well between Assyria and uh, Hebrew. So it's, it's a God crafted a sermon that they would understand the words because he used the loan words between the two languages. So it was very short, concise, and it's very simple. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Words that they could understand from a Hebrew who, you know, is not from them. He didn't look like them. And verse 5, the next sentence is amazing. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They believed in God, and they called a fast, put on sackcloth, and the greatest to the least of them. So they, they believed the message right away, which tells us something of what Jonah evidently did learn in the belly of the fish, which is salvation is of the Lord. He will save whom he desires and it's up to him to determine who to give grace to and who 
him to whom to judge and give condemnation to. It's not ours. It's not our right. It's not Jonah's right. God was teaching Jonah about his self-righteousness and his weakness. And, and so God was forcing Jonah, chasing Jonah in chapter 1, not letting him get away, not letting him jump in the sea, catching him, putting him in the belly of the fish, having him contemplate in his deepest, darkest hour to pray to God to understand something that was down in the darkness of Jonah's heart, which is Jonah's self-righteousness that said, I should be, be able to determine who gets saved and who doesn't. I should determine who gets God's blessing and who doesn't. I should determine that. That was the darkness in Jonah's heart. And, and basically what God was doing was chasing Jonah to put Jonah in a ministry where Jonah would be faced with his own personal sin. Not putting him in a ministry where he's going to have this great impact and, and cause all of his people to grow and to flourish and to, and to worship the Lord. No. We often think God puts, every, put, puts us in ministry so that, so that we'll accomplish great things. It's all about winning. Here God was taking Jonah chasing him and forcing him so that he would be the messenger to Nineveh so that Jonah would face his own prejudice. Jonah would face his own hatred, his own sin, his own self-righteousness and he had to face that in the light of God's truth. This is a story about God and Jonah more than it's about God reaching out to the Ninevites. And so he gave Jonah a seven-word sermon. Literally six when you add the word groups together. Very small, very short. Yet they believed in God. They believed that message. Now you say, Pastor, I, I appreciate that, but how would they even know who God is? They didn't have the Hebrew Scriptures. They didn't have access to the context. They didn't have, they didn't have any idea that they knew Hebrews were their enemies. What's going to cause them? Was it just God... He just zapped them into their hearts, their conscience? Well, in a way, yes. But there was something else going on. You see, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And that's happened a few times. If you Google up, you'll find that, you know, some man was found in the mouth of a whale before and had been there for a day or two. And, 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 and that's happened. So it's not like this, is the, this has never happened before. What happens when you are in a place like that with all the acids and everything else is there, your skin's going to turn all white. You're going to smell horrible. And if Jonah was three days and three, na three nights in this fish, in the water, all the sea water and all that going on, and then he was spit out on the land, chances are very high that someone saw him get spit out on the land and saw this event take place. And as he gets himself to Nineveh, he still had the look that would match a guy who was in a fish. The reputation could have preceded him, but more importantly, the Ninevites' god, their number one god, was a god named Dagon. It's the same god of the Philistines. Same God of that ancient Near East, the Canaanite God. They took all the Canaanite gods and spread out everywhere. And Dagon was half man, half fish. Half man, half fish was Dagon. Here comes a man who was spit out of a fish in the ocean that spit him out of the dry land, came out of the fish, came with this message. That's the only message he needed. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And you know what? They listened. They listened. God provided the backdrop of context so that when they heard his message and his spirit intervened in their consciences, they immediately repented. See, God saves whom he wants and he does it by his word and he does it by the experiences that people have and those two meet in every person's life and the Holy Spirit moves and a person's conscience reflects on what's been going on in their life and they repent and believe and get saved. And we see this in verses 5 and 6 when the people of Nineveh believed in God they called a fast, put on sackcloth 
And not only that, the people all heard this in the city, so they were responding in the city. Verse 7 says, or verse 6 says, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, which means he didn't hear first. The people all heard in the city, and they said, this is the fish man, this is the one who came, this is, and he pointed them to that God. Now, did they worship Jonah? That's our question. Well, it says they believed in God, verse 5, not believed in Jonah. So we see them turning and believing Jonah's message. But when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. So the king believed Jonah's words. He didn't worship Jonah because verse 7 says, he issued a proclamation and it said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Don't let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. So he's saying we know who we are. We know we are wicked. Before any God, we know it's in our conscience. And so we're declaring a fast. Nobody eats, not even the animals. And we turn to God, not to Jonah, but we turn to God that each man may turn from his wicked ways. And, and how we know it's genuine repentance is verse 9. He starts by saying, who knows? Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we may perish. You see, he doesn't say, if we do this, then God will. That's the wrong with so many people who preach these, these days. If you give money, God will. If you sacrifice this, God will. That's what sacrifices are. I've made my payment, now God's got to come through with his delivery. True repentance always starts with who knows. Maybe, maybe God will be merciful. Maybe God will be gracious. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. So this was genuine repentance by the Ninevites from a six or seven word sermon. Just that's all Jonah knew to say for three days. But where he come out of, he tried to get away, God put a fish there, and that was all in the plan so that when he was spit out of the land and came to Nineveh, they would catch his attention or he would catch their attention because of their whole pagan belief in the fish god. What does this show? Well, it shows here very clearly salvation is of the Lord. He works it out. He works out his salvation. He saves whom he's got to save, even with a six or seven word sermon. Because God's worked out all of the background of where people have come from, what their background is, what their experiences have been, what's in their mind, where their convictions of sin have been. And all of that comes together. So when you give a word of encouragement to somebody, when you just share a simple gospel that doesn't have any meat to it in your mind at all, you don't know at all what's been going on for that person. You have no idea how God's been preparing that person. So when you might just say two words, hey, trust God, that might be it. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of how well you could present the gospel to somebody or how perfect you live or how you're doing it to make things happen. Absolutely not. Chapter 3 shows us that God prepares people to even hear a few words and that's all they need. So they responded in a way without any knowledge, didn't know anything about the God of Hebrew Scriptures, didn't know anything about Moses, didn't know anything about the covenant that was supposed to be made and, and we see this and look at verse 10. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity with which he declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God did not destroy them when his patience was already up in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God was saying, I'm set to destroy these people. But all they did was turn to a six-word sermon, and immediately everything changed. You see, they knew they were suppressing the truth. Romans chapter 1. They knew that. They knew they were against God. And so they changed. 
What this shows is, is Nineveh was a wicked people, wicked nation with all kinds of immorality and, and unjust dealings everywhere. But that wasn't their problem. Their problem was they were suppressing the truth about God and they had a wickedness in their hearts toward God. You see, it always starts with how you feel toward God. When there's immorality everywhere in a society, it's not because the people are immoral people. It's because they're irreverent toward God first in their hearts. When we complain about society going downhill and crime is on the rise and why are people taking advantage of other people and why is there immorality, adultery and, and murder and theft? Why is that happening all over the place here? It's not because they are people who just do that. It's because society has chosen to be irreverent toward God, which means I don't need to worship him. I'm okay. Echet me kerk. Okay? Genaya kereke waka or kereke yaka. You know, I've got my church, man. I, I, religion is a part of me. I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. You see, when society begins to disrespect God in how we live, how we pray, how we tithe, how we, how we tend, how we minister to each other, really how we want to live devoutly, how we want to live the Word of God. We'd rather just say, oh yeah, I'm with you guys, I'm Christian. When society's that way, everything begins to turn toward selfishness, murder, the end justifies the means. It doesn't just go that way because people have that in their hearts. No, they have irreverence toward their God in their hearts. The Ninevites had irreverence toward God in their hearts. And it was when they were terrified and saw the living God and just out of a simple message that was prepared by God, he prepared their lives and prepared Jonah for it, even though Jonah had no control over that, came in and he gave that to the Ninevites. Boom, they immediately turned and they said, we are going to change our ways. They completely changed their ways and God immediately provided salvation to them. He did not destroy them. Now, you know, the, the, the bigger question is, well, does this mean they all got saved and they all became children of God and they all are in heaven? I have no idea on that. I do know that he had compassion on them. I do know that he did not destroy them. I do know that they immediately believed in God and by his grace, he gave them that grace and mercy. It's not outside of the bounds of what scripture teaches that these people actually turned to God and became His. It's not out of bounds for that to be true. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is salvation is the Lord. Look how the Lord wrought salvation in chapter 3. The people really had no, they had no like intelligence and, and like cleverness and we did all that. No, they heard a six or seven word sermon by a man who was tired and he didn't want to preach it. In the worst possible way, the worst possible conditions. And you know what? God prepared the people to hear that message and respond. Well, this says, what does that mean for me as a Christian today, church member? What does this mean for you as being a Christ Baptist church? It means, you know what? Salvation is of the Lord. For your children, do you have to speak to them perfectly? Do you have to deal with them perfectly and, and solve every problem in their life? Salvation is of the Lord. Of the Lord. It means you pray. It means you pray for them. You can't, you can't, you know, carefully construct it so they're always listening to Christian music and, and here's a Bible that's open and, and let me give you a verse. And you, you, you can't trick people into the kingdom. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's when people see the living God and realize that this earth and all around us really is in the midst of the supernatural. And it isn't clinging to the natural, but clinging to the supernatural, where wonder begins to really expand and we get real joy because we're connected to the living God. But they have to see that. The Ninevites had to see that. God prepared them for that. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah couldn't understand that. But he did understand it in the belly of the fish when he finally stopped complaining. He came to that conclusion at the end and God spit him out. He was now ready even in his worst possible state, he was ready to preach because God had the message lined up. 
He put the man there, even though the man's heart was not in it, and God had prepared the Ninevites, and they listened, and they turned. So chapter 3, we see the proof. Salvation is of the Lord, 100%. Jonah had come face to face with his own prejudice, his own unwillingness to serve God. Because he couldn't deal with his own sin. And so he's been there up to chapter 2 and now chapter 3, salvation of the Lord. And tomorrow we are going to see in the last chapter what this really is about. And I want to also show you how this book is not just about God going after the Ninevites to, to give salvation to them, but it's actually God's protection of Israel. And we're going to see that tomorrow when we come up. So I'll see you then in Jonah chapter 4.